Our next guest has had a film and television career spanning more than 50 years with such notable roles as Captain Dallas on Alien, Camp Director Zach Bergstrom on one of my childhood favorites, Space Camp. His Emmy Award winning role as Sheriff Jimmy Brock on Picket Fences. And of course, from my years, Commander Mike Metcalf, call sign Viper. He has also been nominated for numerous awards, Emmys, Golden Groves, Screen Actors Guild, and recently wrapped up filming for, <clears throat> in a movie, Hologram for the King with Tom Hanks. Please welcome Mr. Tom Skerritt. Thank you all. Good morning to you. You sound chatty already. Um, I, I th why don't we just launch into some Q and A's? Uh, current, past. Recent stuff? Any questions? You want to start with that? Yeah. Yes, sir. I was wondering, uh, there's been rumors that there's going to be a sequel to the conflict. I thought that would be going. I have every year that there's going to be a sequel. And maybe they're closer to it because they're just running out of material and they have to just bring it out. Quite honestly, that's where the monster is. Seattle, uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, selection process of films is narrowing quite a bit to that which is, has proven uh, financial gain, and that is the theme that seems to now be resurrected from the bottom, as I say, of the barrel. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking in a negative sense, but the reality is that they, if you exclude storytelling, I didn't mean to get into this, but if you exclude new storytellers, new filmmakers, which unfortunately fallen into the last few years, uh, you thereby uh, don't create new themes, new ideas. So they become Marvel Comics and what we're, what we're dealing with right now, certain standard cookie cutter uh, filmmaking. So uh, there's a good chance Long-winded answer, I know, to that, but there's a good chance of uh, Top Gun being done again for that reason. But every, otherwise, every year I hear that. I'm not in connection with it. I live in Seattle, and I uh, I don't hang out, so I don't hear these things. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't heard anyone. Yes, yes, sir. Well, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I fell into this business years ago. I was at UCLA to be a, a director, and I was an English major at the time, and uh, uh, I, I thought if you're going to be a director, you've got to act. You have to know what hot is by touching it. So I started acting, and I was still writing as, as an English major, and I was drawn toward directing. And uh, I fortunately had a scene acting. I was hired to be in a little dollar 98 movie, and I met a television director who was turned out to be Robert Altman. And I mentored with him, and then I mentored with Al Ashby, and then I mentored with Ridley Scott and Tony Scott uh, when I did Top Cop, uh, the late Tony Scott. So I had this good fortune of being able to have some of the best iconic uh, filmmakers as mentors uh, in those years. Um, so for Ridley, it was, uh, a lot of this is learning not only how to frame a picture, but how to deal with people effectively. Uh, crews and cast are all, we're all one, we're all really, uh, if you don't have a collaborative mentality, it's going to affect the film. And uh, all of these guys I mentioned, these four specific directors, were all very collaborative. Uh, we always felt that we were, it makes the crew, it makes the cast all feel that they have really been giving an extra uh, contribution to the success of the film. And it, the success of the film, quite honestly, is based on the quality of the script, how well laid out the material is, and then the director. 
It's not about movie stars. We're, we only benefit from the best efforts of the writer and the director. Long, long answer, I know. But I've got a long history in it. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you about one of my favorite movies. Well, two movies, actually. The first, my favorite movie of yours, The Mash. Um, how is that working with uh, Robert Altman and his uh, kind of improvisation? Yeah. The, other, the other movie, uh, Ted, uh, how did that come about? Were they brought you into that uh, context? <laughs> that? Those are good questions. Yeah, I like those kind of questions. Because Mash, uh, to this day, I've never had more fun in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Altman himself, I don't think I'd be in the business without him. Uh, him and uh, Hal Ashby did Harold and Bob coming home and being there. Um, uh, the uh, Ted situation, I got a call, phone call one day from Seth MacFarlane asking if I would, would, would you be you? <laughs> If what, I thought. Um, but that's how that came about. And I thought, sure, why not? I've done a lot of those little vignettes like that over the years. And Harold and Maude, for example, Hal Ashby, Ashby being a friend of mine, uh, called one night. He was shooting Harold and Maude, he said, uh, which I had been very uh, involved with when he was casting that. Uh, Bud Corder played Harold in that was in uh, MASH with me, and I suggested him. And Hal called up one day and said, the uh, Daly's, uh, the, the, the guy who played the cop, had hopped on a motorcycle and rode out of the shot, and he had his kickstand down, and it jammed, and he was thrown off the bike, he broke his leg, and Hal was very uh, upset about the guy getting hurt. And, uh, so I went up to play the motorcycle cop, which was just a one day thing, but it gave me some money to get up there and to mentor with him for the week, stay there for a week and just see how he went about his business, which was, was a great, astonishing ease. He was an Academy Award winning editor before he shot that film. So he had, he, he would shoot to the edit and uh, just do that without having to explain that to anybody. So these phone calls come up and you go do them and you enjoy them because of the filmmaker who's asking to do these things. Um, up in smoke! <laughs> Which is now legal in Washington. <laughs> um, and in Colorado. But uh, yeah, that was another thing of running into those guys, the producers and the directors. I'd li like to tell you these things because there's a lot more than just, uh, there's a lot of just friendships and relationships that have to do with this. And uh, I ran into the guys in Westwood uh, near UCLA one day and I said, hey, we're doing this movie next week. Why don't you come on over and do this thing, Strawberry. So that's how that came about. And the same thing with the Ted and the thing with Tom Hanks, again, the director called me uh, last year, uh, the last, the first part of the year, and he says, uh, would you come over to Berlin and do, uh, uh, play Tom Hanks' dad in this thing for this, just a phone call, which is a very funny phone call. It's a long tirade that the father launches on it. Sure, why not? Um, we had a month, I took my wife, a uh, seven-year-old, and we went to Berlin and Prague and Paris, and, you know, got to basically have that financially supported by doing the job. So there are different reasons for doing it, and it's usually the filmmaker. The filmmaker is somebody you want to spend time with, and in this case, too, Tom Hanks, because he's a hell of a nice guy, terrific guy. So that's how they come about. I'm not a very much of a career conscious guy, to tell you the truth. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be able to make a living doing what I do. I, I fully embrace it as uh, being charmed, blessed, <coughs> and I'm very appreciative of it. I don't take it for granted at all. So, Good take afternoon. that. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm so glad that you're here today. And I just wanted to ask you, you've worked alongside so many different actors over the years. Who was your favorite to act alongside and why? 
You know, it's it's the, that question is somewhat like what's your favorite film that you've been in and what's your favorite role. Um, I don't, I couldn't say because I, just to be able to make a living doing this stuff is quite enough for me, and for me to take and distinguish one thing from another is <clears throat> missing the point of what the total means. But uh, I've been very unusually fortunate. The first job I ever had, excuse me, when I was at uh, Red Out of UCLA was in a little Dollar A movie with four other actors. Uh, one was Robert Redford, another Sidney Pollack when he was still an actor. So Redford and I are the only, uh, he's the only one with whom I've remained friends with for a long, all these umpteen hundreds of years. <laughs> and, um, so I've been in this peculiar situation, I will point this out, of being with these guys before they started, like Redford was just on his way up. It was my first job, I didn't even have an agent, I wasn't looking for work as an actor, but I felt, well, how great is this? I'm being hired as an actor at, from right out of college, um, the good fortune of being able to put in, be put into this company, which I realized at the time, to be able to watch how this stuff goes down for real, because other colleges can only teach you theory. And there's nothing better than the IQ, EQ, the getting out in the, the street smarts that you learn by faulting in front of a camera and, and redeeming yourself in some way. But that, uh, and then um, Turning Point, which was about ballet and um, Wonderful film with Shirley MacLaine and, and Bancroft and Top Gun with Tom Cruise as his own. And Steel Magnolias with um, Miss Roberts as in her rides. And uh, Brad Pitt, Never Runs Through It. And a few other situations where working with uh, these guys and women, women that were just emerging. But the women, I have to say, are the most, the most enjoyable to be with. Uh, Steel Magnolias and Turning Point were, were with, with the dominant characters were women. I don't have a problem with strong women. In fact, I've, I've always found that you know, life is largely about conflict and resolution, and you've got to understand that, and that each day is meant to be a challenge. And for us guys, you ladies are a challenge. <laughs> And the best conflict and resolution is when we understand that and uh, allow the, the, the give and take of being with a strong woman, and particularly in the arts. Because these ladies, these, these are tough bras. Steel Magnolia, there were six of them. <laughs> and uh, I was sort of, uh, I had, there, keep in mind from the beginning that I, I was just the, I was the puppy. And, uh, I was a mascot, if, you know, we were having dinner, each one of these ladies would cook a dinner. We were down in Nagash, Louisiana, and they would say, all right, Saturday night uh, after work, we're gonna have, we're gonna have dinner at my house. And of course, I was always invited, uh, and as long as I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's, when you're with a lot of strong women, they have a lot to say. And when they, <laughs> And they say it on many levels. They've got a lot of things going on. We don't know how to handle that. And uh, it's best we just be, be quiet. <laughs> because every time, isn't it true, you, start, you try to interject, you say, um, yeah, well, I have something to add to that. And they do this thing, don't really go like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> And they have no idea whether they heard you, what you thought was a pretty good interjection. Sorry, a pretty good in interjection. Thoughtful. Nothing. It just, <laughs> they've got their own agenda, and that's bless their hearts for it. I just so, I so adore women for this ability to put up with us. Does that answer your question? Yes. That was a long answer. No, that's great. Thank you. I feel like an old chest in an attic. If you open it up. <laughs> <laughs> All the logs are coming out of it. <laughs> yeah.
Yes. Yes, sir. Is there any role that you have not done yet that you would like to do? Oh, I don't know. I, I think everyone, every job offer, I've been really fortunate to, over the years, to uh, find myself in films that were classics and, and understand very early on in the process that uh, uh, I, where I found myself was something to be uh, very appreciative of. So, uh, a role, I don't know. You know, there's some that, uh, for one reason or another, I, I couldn't do, but there, that's just conversation, you know, those things that regrets about not doing this or not saying yes to that. Uh, I don't I don't favor regrets. I don't think that's a pretty good shelf to sit on. It's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. It's negative. Yes, sir. Um, about oh. Um, it's more of a question about the, the process. Um, the way films are made, not shot in sequence, and having to trust the director and, and the other artistic influences and whatnot to understand what, what the scene you're going to be shooting in. How difficult is that, not only for you, but in your experience with other people, to actually kind of maintain character when you're not going sequentially, when you read the script, it's, oh, we, we have this series of events and you start at the end and have to go backwards sometimes. Just a minute, I'm sure this is my wife. She's on the road. Oh, honey, can I come in back? I'm also a writer, so I'm very aware that uh, uh, it, it's, we want, the public always, we all want to categorize things. And uh, there is television writing, there's novel writing, there's short, short story writing, there's screenplays, and there are plays. Plays I happen to be in fortunate to be invited to do Broadway last year. It's a whole other, a whole other deal. You have to rehearse it. Now, one of the things for all of us, com the common thing between three of them, um, is that memorization is one thing, performing it is quite another, because it's sort of, you, you, the memorization is getting the material, picking out the material, making the suit. And you put the suit together, and the rest of it is now getting in the fit the damn thing. You know, the legs, the arms, the back, the sides, and the, you know, how it's belong, when the coat hangs on you, and the sleeves, everything like that. And that's a, putting those two together is really what the difficulty is. Stage, you have a chance to rehearse all those things and really work them out, and then be thrown out there and make sure you hit them, hit them right spot on the stage and say their lines that they need to be, uh, need to cue the other actors, all that sort of thing. Television and film, you, know, you have that luxury of uh, blowing it, particularly now because we're working in digital, by, by and large. So we don't have to worry about cost of film, and that becomes a whole other now leap that I've had to make over the years from film to uh, the liberty, the freedom that digital allows to if you don't, if you're not happy with your performance, then you you back it up and say, oh, let, let me start again and go at it. Because there's that one thing to say the line is another thing to have an emotional line go away. And uh, all of those, it sounds fairly complicated, but it becomes much easier the more you do it. So.
So uh, I don't think too much about the um, dysfunctional uh, arrangement of scenes being doing the end of the thing the first day, for example. Uh, but the, the only attachment that you have and that the director has to be in charge of is whatever you did in the middle of the script or at the, last, the end has to then be carried somehow or another or bear in mind that you did this uh, 50 page in. So you can't, we have to cut this out and we have to rearrange this and you approach it that way. So there's a little of that. So, but there is that, that it's just a different energy. Does that happen a lot if you're started off somewhere else? It does as a director and writer, which I am. Uh, I just recently shot a web series. And I put it together and I said, no, this scene works better as the opening scene. Which then affects uh, two or three scenes in, that they don't now sequence in the way they thought they did. So you change a little dialogue to say he instead of she. You know, the minor change that you had to adjust to given that you've had a circumstance that has changed up front. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I, because I am a writer and I have directed over the years, it, it's quite a different, I have quite a different perspective than most actors have, and uh, I've got a stronger appreciation for the really good writing and, and the really good directors that I've worked with. I know what they're doing. I see what they're doing. And, if you're working with good people, you know, always good as the people you work with. And if you're working with good material, it's inspiring. You know, you look at that and say, wow, I'm going to work with Ridley Scott or Tony Scott or uh, 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 Ross, you know, Ross at the, the, and Altman and all these guys. And I think, wow, they want me? Always retain your humility. This is not a big shot here. We're, we're very fortunate to get on the screen and people recognize you and, and uh, you have all of that acknowledgement. But the real heart of it is without the writers, none of us would have a job. None of us could do the work we do. And it's the writers. It's always the writers. I will never stop believing that the source of every good movie that you go to is on a great deal of work that the writers put forth. I hope that answers some of your question. Thanks for uh, being here today, Mr. Scarrett. It's, I've always appreciated, I've always enjoyed your work over the years. I think I just recently saw you in an episode of Combat, and that was fun to see you at young age with dark hair and everything. <laughs> and you've, uh, you've worked with two of my favorite directors, Hal Ashby and Robert Altman. Um, and uh, I, I tend to agree with you, you know, the, the writer and the director are very important, but I'd have to say also, your name associated, even if it's not like top billing or anything, when your name, I see your name, you're one of those good uh, character type actors you always get something new from your performances, even if it's a mediocre film, mediocre writing. I always, it always brings a little Twitter to my heart saying, "Oh, Tom Skerritt. I mean, even if it's a bad movie, his performance will be good and professional." <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, um, I hope this is like a fun question. But um, do you re do you remember rolling around, or do you have any recollection of rolling around in a? in a sleeping bag with Raquel Welch and Fuzz? Oh, oh in, the, in the sack with Rack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes.
imagine that they're, you know, even in Hollywood, they have a hard time figuring out, you know, some movies come out with a lot of pub, a lot of press, and they're, they're bombs, and then there's other movies that come out, you're not expecting much, and they become all-time classics. So when you did Alien, was that just kind of a cheesy science fiction flick that you guys put together, or did you have a feeling that uh, it, it was going to be almost like a, a, a new genre that you were creating? Well, I turned that down initially when I read it. I was uh, doing another movie. <clears throat> I got this script and said, it's $2 million, there's no director on it, and would I be interested? And I read it and I thought, well, I, this idea of character acting the leading man is not something I quite fully understand. Uh, you're either an actor or <laughs> you're not. And, um, that was one of those things I thought, well, as an actor, I don't find much of a challenge in, in this, and I don't know who's going to direct it. It's $2 million. It's going to make a cheesy movie out of it. So, I had seen The Duelists prior to that conversation, and Ridley Scott was not attached to it at that point. I was the first one that came to us sort of uh, in demand in those days. and. Um, Three weeks later, I got a phone call from the producer saying, well, the budget's kicked up to 10 million, 12 million, whatever it was, and Ridley Scott is going to direct it for so, He barely got Ridley Scott out, and I said, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's about, it's a solid piece of script, but it requires some funding to make a good film out of it, and certainly the visionary to make something what he made out of it. So that, was the catalyst for me as the director. And then the rest was filled in with this wonderful cast that I had the honor of working with. So that's how these things come together. You know, it's just a matter of who's directing it makes a big difference. Intellectuals do not generally make a good film director. It's too much in your head. You gotta have a lot of willingness to be, make errors as a director. So when you were filming Alien, I heard stories that the actors didn't know what was going to happen when the creature first appeared. Is that true? Well, I followed Ridley around a while. Uh, he was this, I read it off the bat, and this is the guy I want to follow, I want to mentor with him. and. Uh, so he let me follow him around like a puppy dog and feeding people and some information periodically. So I kind of had a sense of that. But I didn't know, other actors say, tend to stay in the dressing room. And I don't know, with good filmmakers, the value is really being with the filmmakers rather than waiting for someone to come and get you and stick you into a scene. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the one scene that I did know, none of them, come to, but I watched them set up was the, the indigestion scene. <laughs> a harsh indigestion, indigestion scene. Uh, I, I saw them set it up and I saw them work it out and uh, yet when it was, when it happened, it was, it was pretty a stunning thing, I would have to say. And um, Veronica Cartwright, who the one lady with the short hair and really was a wonderful coach. She was good in that. A lot of her best stuff wasn't quite seen in it, but she was, she just about came in. What you got was, I saw them before the scene bring in buckets of cow innards, basically, and everything with it. So that was what came out. And uh, they had an air pump or something, pushing and all that stuff out. So she got some of that on her face and just slid down the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it was just being patient because a lot of it was new technology and uh, Ridley would stand on his principles of what he needed to have done, which might take some time and some discussion with the producers. Um, or with concern of an additional cost. But uh, beyond that, I think we all know, uh, we all know pretty well what we're involved in. 
But we know it had to be done. So God had already done MASH, so I knew the difference between that which had a great chance in the marketplace and that which did not. So being in the original uh, Dead Zone, was it exciting to be able to be welcomed back for an episode when they did the series later on of the Dead Zone? Of oh, the Dead Zone? Yeah. Well, like how you were, you were in the original, but then years later I saw it. Maybe you being able to come back in the episode and just be part of that style TV series. I, I have no answer for that. <laughs> All right. I wasn't uh, in any conversation about it. Did they name it series? That was, yeah, it's TV series. I know it's Stephen King. I didn't know they made a television series, but that's how much I know. <laughs> <laughs> And you've talked a lot about story, and back on your days on picket fences, they had some scripts, especially back in the early 90s, that really pushed the boundaries. Um, did you ever get a script that you're like, there's no way the network's going to ever let us do this? Every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> had, uh, we couldn't wait to see it. This is a brilliant guy, he wrote like Mozart, never corrected a note. We just got white pages, generally these things always have multi colored pages in them, which indicate rewrites. And we never, we rarely ever got that. Um, and the crew, generally crews are pretty jaded and they don't, they just do the job. We could not wait to get the new script for the next uh, episode in that because we, we didn't know it. The guy would come to work and he'd read, oh God, he'd read some article on cow flatulence that the <laughs> government was putting out $5 million to study, a study on cow flatulence uh, and how the methane was affecting the atmosphere. And uh, he had that kind of devious sense of humor. He said, okay, let's make something out of this one. And he would. Uh, he had an elephant uh, being stolen by a, a short person. And, um, uh, running, running away from the circus, and we have to store, my wife and I, and Kathy Baker and I have to put the elephant in the backyard because we have no zoo in our little town. So we have to do something with the elephant while this poor chap is going through uh, 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 court. <laughs> he had a shot up that I'll share with you. And he loved to tease standards and practices at CBS by putting in outrageous stuff. The elephant upset that's in this particular environment gets constipated. Well, you know, we all do, right, if we're stuck out in the backyard? <laughs> so Kathy, being the uh, doctor, first she's got to give the poor thing an enema with the garden hose. So he has a shot inside the elephant, looking out. <laughs> I never forgot that. I was somewhere in the second or third year that we did that. And I thought, oh, David, you really? What have you been smoking? <laughs> and of course, what the feedback he would get from CBS standards and practice was, uh, David, there's that scene that follows this, and it's, it's that one where, you know, the, it's a, uh, it's trying to, they're fumbling with the words to try to say na nicely that David knock it all off. <laughs> but it's, just, it's the one before this, and it's be, uh, right after this scene, you know, that one with a, is that a scene where you're looking out from the elephant's rear end? <laughs> oh, this kind of language would go down before it. Uh, he knew that they would come back, and of course he, he wasn't going to shoot that anyway, just to tease them. But he did that a lot, <laughs> all the time. He just had the confrontation. Sometimes they let him get away with it. Not that one. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Because I'm glad to have a conversation here. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, for right run through it, you um, had to fly fish. How long did it take you to learn how to fly fish, and do you still fly fish? Yeah, now that's a very um, 
long lasting felt for me. I knew that touched a lot of us on a lot of different levels. And uh, I had never fly fish before. My father and my brother did. Um, we had several teachers, some of the best fly fishermen in the country. And uh, we just did, did it every day until you got the rhythm. You know, like life, it's all about rhythm. And uh, I remember one of those guys, they both love jazz, and we were talking about that. And he's doing this, you know, this wonderful thing, he's talking to me with his arm, and just throwing this thing, and we dime every time. Just throwing it out there, and what a marvelous thing. And he's saying, yeah, he says, some days, and life is largely about rhythm, and some days the rhythm section doesn't show up and the day ain't gonna swing. <laughs> but if it shows up, you got the day, chances are the day's gonna swing. So I, I love that line that he told me and I'm always kind of using it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a ballet, throwing a line out there. But I always found that uh, I enjoyed more of that and the, the ripple, the feel of the river, the current on my legs then catching the fish and reeling it in. It was always about that, nailing it right on your foot. Close to that, because you really had to, you know, you always had to really trout in and uh, let them go. And uh, you'd bark with always. So it's uh, got to be just about hitting that dime more than anything, more than catching a fish. That was a great experience. Thank you for that question. I love westerns, so I was excited to hear you're doing one. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. I'm doing a western? <laughs> Did you say you just directed one? A oh, web series. I wrote, I'm studying, uh, uh, it's a whole new word. We're being introduced now to the new distribution system, which is not going to be the neighborhood theater as much as we become accustomed to, and the whole internet is the web is really the new, new distribution system, and, and we're a uh, group of us are putting together a company to make web series with uh, a certain monetization going on in them. I mean, with product placement and in, in, uh, new ways and. Uh, so that's what my focus is right now up in Seattle. 30 minute, you know, short web series that can be outrageous. There's no uh, censorship on the web. And, uh, outrageous but good taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to have a chance to get to ask this question. Um, I have read, doing some research, that you recently were in the Pacific Northwest Ballet and took on the role of Don Quixote. What was that like for you? Was it just because of the challenge, or did you enjoy ballet? No. I'm just curious. Well, the people that run the Pacific Northwest Ballet, <clears throat> which, by the way, is equal to New York, it's a really great ballet, uh, are friends of ours. And uh, my wife was walking with his wife uh, five miles a day, almost every day. I, uh, Peter came up about a year before, that's three years ago, and said, so would I do, uh, do this? And I thought, well, we all would react at a certain age in our life, say, is this something I want to do at this time in my life? And do I want to learn lines? And all of this sort of thing. And the very act of questioning it causes me to go at it. Something about if I know this is not life-threatening and <clears throat> chances are I won't be physically disabled. <laughs> I'm going to take the challenge, and uh, because it's about the risk. And in fact, I'm coming back again to do it in February. They're going to re uh, re restage it. Uh, and I had some friends that saw it, and they said it was wonderful. So I was uh, really impressed with that, especially yeah. uh, you've got a couple years on me and to be doing a ballet <laughs> like that. I mean, and it's and it's, it's not an easy ballet, so it was. It was very impressive. No, it's, it's not. Fortunately, I didn't have to sing, dance, or just be anything other than myself. <laughs> <laughs> Stumbling around and chasing rainbows and, and uh, windmills and all that. And do we have any other questions for Mr. Skerritt? Yep, right here. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, 
So you've talked about uh, writers and directors, and I get the impression that that's what draws you to a project. Who who do you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? But you know, writers and directors wise. Oh God, I, I really um, couldn't say specifically at this point. It's, a lot of it's changing so much that those guys that I've worked with years past, um, many of them are dead, and many of those I would like to have worked also work with also are gone, so uh, I don't know a lot of the new ones, and they don't know me, <laughs> so, uh, but the writing is really something I always come back to, you know, directors are attracted to writing, and actors, and everybody's attracted to it, just it's the psychology of what quality means to all of us. Again, the more, the better the company, the more the challenge, and it's like I say, the male-female relationship, you know, you're a better man if you've got a good woman that's giving you a hard time in the best way. You know, they just make it. And it's true about material, that scripts require a lot of work. And I value that, being a Midwestern guy. Uh, the work ethic that you see in someone else's work is really something to be respected and honored and appreciated and that's basically what I always rest on is that. Anything else? Yes. Um, as a film school instructor, what type of student is your favorite kind of student and what kind of student really just gets under your skin? Well, the ones that are well written are my favorite. <laughs> And the ones that years ago when I was doing television, which is a different kind of writing, and it's written to 12 minute segments, so emotional arcs are not considered in television writing. So it's best you work always with, I think best you work with, uh, you're working with actors, is that what you do? Oh, I thought you were saying you were, <sighs> sorry. As a film instructor, I work specifically with writers. Uh, how to tell a story, or beginning writers. Because in my experience, having been a English major who was attracted to being a director and who really wanted to be Frank Sinatra, but someone else had the job. <laughs> um, and I couldn't get in front of people anyway, like this, without being very sh shy and withdrawn. So the challenge was I had an opportunity to do some theater. And I thought that would be a good way to overcome this feeling. And uh, never thinking in terms of making a living at it. Anyway, the end is I wound up making a living at it. But always with the beginning years, always with this idea of learning from the filmmaker, learning from the differences between television scripts and the work that goes into a uh, into a screenplay or the work that goes into plays. Only by not only going to theater but going but doing the writing myself. So it's just brought a special perspective for me as an actor that I, I don't I, we all have egos, but I don't find that I have an ego that needs which is usually something that's a protective device because this is you're, you're really good at this and don't let anybody tell you make you feel differently about it. So it's you know, it's kind of a protective thing. I don't feel that particularly. And I, as such, I still don't feel I've done the best work I possibly can. So that's the bait that you want to live with, is knowing you haven't, that you really haven't been the best that you could have been, that you've got more to give, that you've got. Each one of us has an independent experience that yours alone, unlike anything that anyone else in the history of mankind has ever had or ever will have. And it really has value. And that one, I, I remind myself every day, that, well, whether it's a good or bad day, whether the band section, whether the rhythm section shows up or not, it is what it is. Take in what you can, what's gonna work for you, and you continue to move on. And I, that's what you bring to the work as an artist, is, is this kind of experience I'm having now with each other, an, inter, an, an, an exchange between people. 
is really what you get fed up, fed all the time, and that's what we value. Oh yeah, it takes time now to come up with the work. And now because things are changing so dramatically, we can't suggest to them that they have to take two years before they can write a long form <coughs> script worth showing anyone, which is basically the truth. We have to now understand and suggest to them that they look at the web series possibly, because it's a freeing thing. It has no form to it. Uh, there is always a three-act form in the end for any series that go on the beginning five years and then an end somehow or another. But web series have uh, just this <coughs> latitude to play with, experiment with, tr test the waters in a way that you can't in any other medium. So uh, that's what we're pushing now is making that transition. And I'm finding, yes, there are some students that are coming out that will eventually, I think, make some headway. But that takes years. No one, all this stuff of making it overnight is one two million probably for anybody in, in the arts. So it, it, it ain't a predictable de device. Well, any other questions? Well, I'll close with a final question. As a former Seattleite, the million dollar question, if you have an opinion, best clam chowder in Seattle, do you we go D Dukes or Pike Place Market? <laughs> oh, well, I, I got, there are so many great restaurants, and they have great, too many great chefs to begin with for the population. However, it now is the fastest growing city in the country, so, and that's going to increase because of the water issues that the uh, Southwest has. That's a whole other conversation. But uh, it's going to be, there are going to be a lot of mouths to feed in the future up there, so there are some really good restaurants to go to, Duke in particular, one of them. and. Uh, uh, some other remark. Tom Douglas has 19 restaurants up there, and every one of them are different and terrific to go to. So I'd certainly recommend Tom Douglas. All right, fantastic. Well, if there's no other questions, let's hear it from Mr. Tom Skerritt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.